When we simplify cybersecurity, we mislead because what we do is complicated. <laughs> there's, there's no getting around the fact that cybersecurity is a complex topic that requires a great deal of time and effort to master properly. This is a Security Weekly production. Security Weekly is a resource of Cyber Risk Alliance. The Cybersecurity Collaborative is proud to present CISO Stories. Each week, CISO Stories takes a deep dive on security leadership with one of the contributors to my latest book, the best-selling CISO Compass Navigating Cybersecurity Leadership Challenges with Insights from Pioneers, as well as other top CISOs and industry security leaders. The Cybersecurity Collaborative is a unique membership community enabling cybersecurity leaders to work together in a trusted environment. To learn more, visit securityweekly.com slash CSC or visit cyberleadersunite.com. I am your host, Todd Fitzgerald, and this week we welcome Dr. Edward Amoroso, CEO, TAG Cyber, and former Chief Security Officer at at and You know, my dad was a um, computer scientist, and I had the opportunity to grow up in kind of a geek family <laughs> where, you know, where we, uh, we had a connection to the um, ARPANET, you know, in the 70s. So I have a lot of really good advice about computing. And maybe in the mid 80s, when I was graduating from college, I had a physics degree. My dad sensed that I was probably going to get into computing as well. It was sort of inevitable. And we were having um, sushi in New York City. And I remember he said, you know, I, I have an idea for you. And I said, what do you think, dad? And he goes, why don't you get into computer security? I think that's going to be a big area. We, we both knew Dorothy Denning at the time. He goes, why don't you go try and get a job there and some good place where they're doing it? And I ended up going to Bell Laboratories and had the opportunity to work on Unix security. Talk about died and went to heaven, right? So um, <laughs> you know, Unix security at Bell Labs in the early 80s, really, really, really exciting. Got a chance to meet the people like Brian Kernahan and others, can you imagine, right? So, um, so that's, that's how it started. It's a kind of an unfair advantage when um, you have that kind of guidance from somebody. I, I, I've heard that from several people who their, their parents said, you know, had some sort of a, a pathway into that, but what a, what a great, uh, great way to start a career with Bell Labs. I mean, I know so many great things came out of there. It was um, for people who didn't grow up in the era, let's say from the 40s to the 80s, it was so many different things wrapped up in, in one, right? And on the one hand, it was connected to an in, in industrial kind of um, revenue generating powerful company, the Bell System. So you had the cover of funding. You didn't have to worry about from one year to the next, whether your project was going to be funded because it was funded by telephony. Um, but by the same token, it was multidisciplinary. An old sort of story that we would joke about is that when federal government demanded that Bell Laboratories do research and spend, I think it was something like, you know, I forget how much uh, penny of every dollar or something like that has to go into research. The executives at the time, the joke was, we want them to do research, but we don't want them messing with our phone network. So it was like, do whatever you want. You want to do metallurgy, you want to do chemistry, you want to do physics, go rock and roll. You know, and what, what came out of that? The transistor. <laughs> so, so, mm -hmm. was, so by giving a bunch of creative people the opportunity to work on things that didn't necessarily have to have a direct impact on the business, it created a really amazing environment. I think today we live in a world where it's hard to imagine a large company funding a massive research program mm. and, and encouraging them to not worry about it having business applicability. That seems like that would be on planet Mars from where we are today. But um, when you do do that, you get a, a lot of good comes out of that. And, and you were the, the eventually the, the CISO of AT&T, correct? Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that's sort of near and dear to my heart. My, my parents um, had AT&T stock from like the 50s. 
<laughs> and when when you know my mother passed away in the in the two thousands, uh, we had all these companies <laughs> because as they had split up into so many different companies and had all of this stock, and it is just amazing how many different companies were just spawned from that. The um, you know telephony and and just communications in general is such an important part of the social fabric. Like if you think about it, the one thing that unifies humans and the thing that makes us unique animals is our ability to communicate and cooperate. That's what, that's what, what the essence of being human. So the idea that uh, these, these, these large companies like AT&T would exist for so long and continue to thrive I think reflects that, that the, this urge and need for businesses and, and people to communicate. That's why you, you go into that. Like a, a lot of us, like myself, who still view network and telecommunications as their, you know, kind of home turf. I mean, I do cybersecurity at Tag Cyber, my, my uh, analyst group. We cover all aspects of cybersecurity, but um, Obviously, telecommunications and network is an area of particular focus. It, it's it's just exciting when you you think about it. So the idea that the bell system branched, it breaks up and then it goes back together and it breaks up. It's like this crazy thing. Mm -hmm. I think that that living, breathing corporate change is a good reflection of how networks operate. They're live, they're dynamic, they change, but the fundamentals never change, and that's the the urge and the need for people to cooperate and to communicate and coordinate. That's the essence of, of who we are as people. Mm -hmm. And um, it was always a great honor and great privilege to, to have the responsibility to keep uh, malicious actors away from that so that we could accomplish those objectives. Yeah. Very, very tough task indeed. Hey, your piece that you wrote for the, <clears throat> Your piece that you wrote for the CISO Compass book, uh, Navigating Cybersecurity Leadership Challenges from Pioneers, uh, which you clearly were a pioneer in this space, um, you talked about a, a story uh, where you were with uh, Bell Labs and your checkbook. Uh, could, could, could you walk us through that, that story? Well, the, in the old days, <clears throat> there was this concept that um, physical security was the foundational component of protecting data because you, you had this idea that um, you walk in a building, like you walk in the corporate headquarters, and you're now in this quote-unquote enclave. So security teams would police those, those corporate buildings the way we would do data scanning now on a network. And I remember the first uh, week or so, I put my checkbook in my top drawer and I came back and there was a note from corporate security saying, um, it's against policy to, to leave a checkbook in your thing. And I thought, oh my gosh, they're <laughs> trolling through my stuff here. But it's a wonderful metaphor for the way we now do data discovery. So we would think nothing, for example, of an individual who's putting some sort of financial data or something of, of, of use, of, of, you know, value, practical or personal or corporate value, finding it, tagging it, that's what the sensitivity label is, and then notifying the user that we found it and that there may be some issue there. So what seemed like such an odd, weird thing to me then has kind of an interesting analog to what we do now virtually. It's, I think it's always fun to go back and look at the tangible, physical, extrapolated forward to what we do on internets and networks and, and enterprise and see if, the, um, if we have the same reaction. Sometimes we don't. And, and I think we can, we can visualize much easier for some reason the, the physical pieces of security uh, why we give those examples about you know securing your house uh, all the time or your car because uh, people can relate to those uh, you know versus the cybersecurity seems to be something that's out there that people have a harder time grasping onto could be generational, you know, like from that's your point. I, I, I connect with what you just said. Like for me, 
I do have an easier time visualizing. It's like when you say we play word association, like word image association, you say word, I do an image in my mind. If you say data center, the picture that comes into my mind is that thing you walk into this big, giant, monstrous room with uh, coolant and racks of equipment and whirring noise. And I've, I've spent so many hours in those places. That's not really the way data centers operate now. They tend to be more distributed. They're more virtual. They're, it's not such a tangible thing. So that's what I think. Now, take my kids. You know, my, my kids are all, um, my, my youngest daughter, for example, she's in, in, at NYU. She's a student there. If you say bank to her, she doesn't think of a bank branch office. In fact, dare I say, I wonder, I was, almost wish she were here because I could ask her, I don't think she's ever been in a bank branch in her life. <laughs> it's very possible. I don't remember ever bringing her. She probably never has been in a bank. So isn't that interesting? Because when you say bank to me, I used to serve on the board of directors of um, M&T Bank, you know, large, um, large bank in the, here in the U.S., when you say bank to me, I still think of the, the teller and the pen connected with that weird wire so you don't steal the pen and the little date thing that they must change every day that's just the little block letters. I think of that, but my daughter doesn't. So I'm pretty sure that over time, the more virtual incarnation of a lot of these um, societal components Will, will be more natural to people who've grown up with um, technology and with internet, with virtual. And uh, they'll think someone like myself to be very old fashioned in, in the images that pop up in my mind. The article this podcast is based upon can be viewed in the best-selling cybersecurity leadership book, CISO Compass, Navigating Cybersecurity Leadership Challenges with Insights from Pioneers. That's a really good point. I, I think we have to be talking about apps and the phone. And yeah. uh, I have an older brother, for example, that that he still has his flip phone and he's fighting like crazy to not have to get a new one, but he has to get a new one because we're moving on from 3G. And so uh, he has to replace it. And they don't, he wants one without any apps on it. He doesn't want to even know what that world is about or, I remember walking into a data center and you even see the transformation. I remember the big mechanical uh, arms that were moving and selecting tapes. Uh, and, and then I remember walking into one one day and then you don't even see those anymore because we don't have these big things that are moving tapes around. And, and, and I guess we all have to move along. And so as we move along security, how have you found, you know, selling senior management on on security? What what sort of uh, techniques and and things seem to be resonating when when we're talking to the board and to the executives to to uh, help with this message? Let me offer two points. One that I think most people will find very familiar and probably will resonate. And one that I think is going to be very counter to what a lot of um, pundits are offering. I have a very contra view in how cybersecurity should be communicated, for example, to boards. So I'll say the conventional thing first, and that's that executives and companies and boards are becoming much more aware of cyber. No question about it. Like they, It's a higher priority. It's something that... Um, they recognize as having an impact not only on the reputation of the company, but frankly, on their own personal reputations. You know, when a um, company gets hacked, you could argue that the real consequence in many cases is to the individuals who are involved, more so than, say, to the stock. Like, if you go back and look at these traditional hacks like to Target and Sony and uh, Home Depot, and so there's like the canonical textbook examples from the, you know, from 10 years ago, I, the, all of those businesses seem to be doing fine to me. The target near my house looks pretty busy. A lot of cars in the parking lot there, they <laughs> seem like they're okay, but the executives, not so much, you know, the people who were involved at the time, uh, a lot of them <laughs> lose their job. Right. So, so, so that's the conventional thing. The unconventional piece is that most of the time the advice that's given to people like myself and to a lot of your listeners 
is that they should express cybersecurity in these business terms that people will understand. And while I'm all for communicating, you don't want to be talking past each other. Let me say something a, a bit provocative. When we simplify cybersecurity, we mislead because what we do is complicated. <laughs> it's, there's, there's no getting around the fact that cybersecurity is a complex topic that requires a great deal of time and effort to master properly. So when we boil it down to these trite, simple views that it's really just the people, you know, it's really a business issue, it's sort of uh, firewalls like a door, you know, just you, uh, like these simple analogies. There's really only six, or if we just do these five or six things, if people just uh, pick not share passwords, we'd be just fine. These are all misleading. And it, it leads board executives and leads senior managers down the wrong path. They suspect that this is just a matter of getting us all in line, that we really do know how to solve cybersecurity problems. We're just lazy, or we just need to be cajoled. Or a government would say, well, we just need to demand that companies uh, acknowledge that they've been hacked, and that'll get them in line. I think that that stems from us overly simplifying the problem. What they need to understand is that this is a spectacularly difficult challenge to do cyber defense. It involves the use of hundreds of different complicated tools that have to be orchestrated together into an architecture. It requires understanding things down at the chip level all the way up to the massive cloud level. So it's a orders of magnitude of size and complexity and scale that have to be mastered. And it involves dealing with a live adversary that's pretty good, nation state. We're not dealing with a bunch of hacker kids anymore. Um, and they were never really much of an adversary in the beginning. They were our friends. They were finding problems and helping us solve things. Now you're up against nation states. For these reasons, I've been advising the CISOs that we coach and support at Tag Cyber to not dumb things down, not to make things too complicated, but to not dumb it down. And if a board member feels they don't understand it, I'm going to say something a little tough love here. That's their problem. You know, go figure it out. Like when I joined the bank board, nobody slowed down for me. And there would have been real social consequences if I raised my hand and says, hey, what's a EBITDA? Hey, what's, um, what do you mean by an income statement? What's that? Could you even imagine? Like I did, <laughs> men have been kicked off the board, but there'd have been social consequences. That's for sure. Like, whoa, wow, that guy doesn't know anything. Well, it should be the same thing for cyber. We shouldn't slow down when we say we're moving from behavior analytics to machine learning, and here's why. If, if that is, causes someone pause because they don't know the difference, then go figure it out or self-select off that board because these are relevant topics. If somebody says we're moving to a passwordless platform, that should not be mysterious to someone in 2022. Give me a break. Microsoft made it conventional with Windows Hello. So these are basic topics to us, but they may be a little difficult to somebody who's a non-practitioner. And I've been coaching and I've been offering our, our research customers a tag, the guidance that you really don't want to dumb these things down. Let people take the time to learn. And if they can't learn, then they've got to self-select out of the position. A little tough love, but I really believe it. So, should we be giving our boards that that education uh should that be part of what the CISO does is is i don't know you know some sort of guidebook that if they don't know these things that you know that then they can learn about them no i don't think we should i think board education is a bad idea i'll give you an example and i think mean, that's counter to what not you get 100 people together 99 are saying oh educate the board but i say no and i've been a board member so let me tell you why how would it sound if you got your board members together and you said, oh, let's do some financial education? Okay, here is the left side of the ledger, and here's the right side of the ledger, and these are called your assets, and these are called it's utterly and preposterously ridiculous. You join a board because you have judgment and you have experience and you've been in the game. You're supposed to be ready day one to serve. We don't hire people to serve on boards because they have potential to learn something. We hire people on boards because they have experience and judgment from a lifetime of having done what's relevant. 
So when you show up and you say, hey, I need to be trained, I don't get that. I don't understand what that even means in a board context. The problem is it's an age problem. And I know people get mad at me when they say that. It's not that I'm being you know, um, you know, uh, you know, I'm discriminating against. I'm just looking empirically at the average age of board members. They come on to this at a time in their career when they grew up without internet security, without CISOs and part of their uh, company. So they don't have that innate judgment that you get having been a finance manager. I'll give you an example. When a, a finance report comes to any board and it comes in and there's all the paperwork and everything there and the PowerPoints and they go through the numbers, then the presenter will leave, the board will close the door and everybody leans back in their chair and someone will say, you know, I saw that data, but my instinct tells me this or that. And the others go, yeah, I think so. And they rely on their judgment from having been experts and practitioners. They'll take the data as input, but they rely on judgment to make a decision. When the cyber person comes in and shows all the data, and then they leave and close the door, they don't have that judgment. They don't have the experience. So they're not sure what to do. And what happens is they hire a head turner. What that means is one person who's in the room who has some experience. And after the cyber presentation goes, all heads turn to that one person and say, what do you think? And suddenly an entire board is just making a decision based on the experience of one person in the room. So the age issue means that the next generation of board member will grow up with this kind of experience and judgment. We won't have this problem in a few years. So I don't know if in the meantime, you feel like you got to train people. I guess so, but I'd rather see them self-select. If you don't have the experience to do cyber and you sit, say, on a bank board, I don't think you should be there. I think you don't belong there. Look, I said a minute ago, my daughter has never been in a bank branch. She only knows virtual. So how can you serve on a bank board without understanding that most of your younger yeah. customers don't even know anything other than mobile apps and virtual and security and two-factor and on and on and on. You're, you just don't have the judgment to be there. You shouldn't be there. I know that's, like I said, it's a little tough love, Todd, mm -hmm. but we're, I'm just trying to get us all out of this problem where everybody's getting hacked one incident after another, and this is one of the reasons. And it really, really promotes this idea that, that our executives in companies, not just the CISO, and not just the CIO, but, but they all need to have this understanding of security and, and what all this means. If they're going to be effective executives within the company um, before they're moving on to that board level. I think that's my message. And I'm still waiting for someone in the CISO role to be promoted into a completely non-technical, non-security position that is like, say, the head of HR or the um, head of marketing or the CEO of the company. Now, I'm not talking about in security companies, like I could see a Palo Alto Networks or Fortinet. Yeah, I get that. I mean, like in a bank or manufacturing firm or in a, and the reverse too, to see someone who was running marketing move over and run the security group. I think that would be a good idea. I think mm -hmm. executives should be moving around and security should be one of the required disciplines that you learn before you become the CEO. That's the whole point today. CISO is a terminal position for somebody who does cybersecurity because you would never think to move the CISO to some other thing. It'd be like, what? That, the CISO, she is our expert in cyber. They would never think of her as a general executive. And I, I think until we break that, that sort of ceiling, that barrier, we're going to have this problem. It'll happen, but it hasn't happened yet. I think this is great advice, Ed, and, and I, I want to thank you for taking the time to do this. Um, I, is there any uh, final thoughts that, you, that you'd like to give our listeners as they're going down this CISO journey? I'm glad you asked. I do have a final thought that I ask everyone to consider in the context of cyber. I, I believe that the best solution to our cybersecurity problem is longer term, meaning 
we need better designs. We need better, uh, uh, you know, engineers know what they're doing, really building out the very economically simple and clean and, and elegant designs. So your youngsters today, your kids are the next generation of technologists. And, and I think that the best thing you could do right now, if you're worried about cybersecurity, like nation state attacks and stuff, get your sixth grader and help her with her math homework today. That's that's the best thing you can do. <laughs> like, 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 let's get our kids reinvigorated around math and science. It's a terrible thing that um, there's so many youngsters, particularly young young girls. I have two daughters, who I think that there's an inherent bias against um, really encouraging these uh, young kids, especially young girls, to get into master's, PhD track in computer science. Look at the numbers; they've dropped off. So help your sixth grader with her homework or his homework but go and focus on math, science, math, STEM. That's where here in the United States and everywhere, we, we need to get kids re, uh, reinvigorated in that area. So that's probably not what you were expecting, but that, that would be my advice for people to do today. I, 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 think, it's, I think that's great advice. Um, well, thanks, Ed, uh, and thanks for taking the time to share your uh, valuable insights with us. My pleasure. Thank you. Visit more CISO Stories podcasts on securityweekly.com, where you will find an index to prior episodes. The Cybersecurity Collaborative is a unique membership community enabling cybersecurity leaders to work together in a trusted environment. To learn more, visit securityweekly.com slash CSC or visit cyberleadersunite.com.